Professor Leo Burke. Leo, I have known now you and about you for several years. We have interacted on and off, worked together. Now I'm delighted to be part of your life and good to have you in my life. And I think today we spend a fair amount of time on our conversation. I'd like to use this opportunity to really learn a little bit about you, about your childhood, about what you do, also about the teaching that you do at the university. And then we can talk a little bit about our initial conversation on Adida. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's take one by one. Can you okay. tell me a little bit about your sure. background and childhood? Where were you born? What sure. did you do? It would sure. be interesting to know, friend, in a little more details. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, born in 1948, so I'll be 65 this year, in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Grew up in Virginia. Uh, went to high school there. I went to university at the university I currently teach at, the mm -hmm. University of Notre Dame. Wow. So I went there age 18, and I never went back to Virginia after that. Exactly. So that started uh, a whole kind of new life in a sense. And when I was a uh, student at uh, Notre Dame, it was in the heyday of the late 60s with all the things going on with regard to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so there was tremendous uh, I remember that. turmoil in the... I was drafted to go to Vietnam. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So when I was a senior, we had the, um, uh, the terrible incident that happened at Kent State, where students were killed by uh, National remember. Guard people. Absolutely. Uh, one campus after another around the country began to shut down, and including ours. And it was a time when... Uh, we thought as students, it's a revolution. Something tremendous is going to change. And uh, interestingly, uh, when the draft was ended, a lot of these protests went away. Yep. And uh, somehow people got on to all the hippies. Uh, some stayed as hippies and some went and got jobs. And But society kind of normalized again. And uh, uh, the vision of what a society could be that we had in those days in the 60s never really met its promise. So people grew up. I grew up, had a family. What did you study? I studied as an undergraduate uh, sociology. Mm -hmm. First time I went to graduate school, I got a master's in political science. Mm -hmm. Another time I got a master's in organization development. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one job after another. Um, Raised, had uh, two children and uh, first marriage, and then was actually a single parent for about five years. Um, uh, remarried, had another child uh, and a couple of stepkids, so a total of five. And then um, worked for Motorola mm. for. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, okay. 12 years. Oh, my Motorola. God. Motorola. Doing what? Well, I was always in employee education, at oh, first okay. sure. engineering sure, education. Sure. sure. And in fact, we developed the first um, software uh, training curriculum in Good. the country. And uh, then the first RF uh, curriculum for engineering. Yeah, Bob Galvin was good on education. He was Bob great. Galvin was tremendous. He was great. Tremendous. He was a good commitment. friend and yeah, yeah. great guy. Yeah, Loved absolutely. Him. Loved him. Yeah. You know, we used to work together at, at IIT. Oh, that's right, because he was on the board. board. Yeah. Yeah. He used to be on the board. Yeah. A uh, tremendous leader and one of the best listeners I yes. ever met. A very good human being. I, I learned many, many things from him. And the, uh, I was, uh, the last half of my time at Motorola, I was in the global education organization called Motorola University. I traveled a lot. We did cutting edge leadership development programs in China and in India, my first visit to India uh, in those days in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, around the year 2000, I was offered uh, a job at Notre Dame. I was recruited by the dean to be the associate dean of executive education. And at first turned the job down, not wanting to leave Motorola. But the, the dean at the time, Carolyn Wu, was very persuasive. And over time, I began to think, well, maybe this has some interesting possibilities. So I went to Notre Dame in 2000. Interestingly, moved there. Yeah. Uh, I, well, my family always stayed in Chicago, okay. and I had a, a place in uh, South Bend. And interestingly, uh, in 2001, Motorola started a series of layoffs that included many of my colleagues at Motorola University. So you I got that. out of a burning building before the roof caved in. And uh, I also, before I left uh, Motorola, I went to say goodbye to some people. So I visited Bob Galvin because he had been a great uh, uh, mentor, not you know often co having contact, but uh, often sure. enough. And I just thanked him for everything he had done for me. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, it was very interesting because he was always so subtle. He said, you know, I'm sure you're going to Notre Dame. You'll do many, many good things, and that'll, you'll have a very good department. He said, but if you want to have a great department, you really need to open up and do something in Chicago in a big way. So two weeks later, I proposed that we start an executive MBA program in Chicago, and in addition to the one in South Bend, wow. based on Bob's uh, admonition. And uh, today, we're, uh, it's a very, very viable mm -hmm. executive MBA program. So uh, I began teaching after a couple of years of just solid administrative work, kind of doing the teaching with being an associate dean. Left the deanship uh, about 2008 so I could concentrate more on teaching and also on other activities that I'm doing outside. And it's been particularly rewarding. And the course that you've spoken at mm -hmm. uh, a couple of times now, mm -hmm. uh, to great effect with the students, and we much appreciate it, is one called Emerging Trends in Business and Society. Mm -hmm. So we take a look at what the unfolding trends are in the world, what some of the implications are for business, and how our students can really broaden their perspectives. They take it right before they graduate, uh, broaden their perspectives on not only what's going on in the world, but what their responsibilities in the world are. And so that's uh, been, yeah, very, very interesting. I enjoy that a great deal. How yeah. do you find your uh, MBA students? Yeah. Are they really more aware of the global issues or they're very narrow in their... Yeah, yeah. Well, these are executive MBAs, right. so it includes doctors, yes, lawyers, yes, hedge doctor, fund yeah. managers. Yeah, senior people. Yeah, yeah. A whole range of folks. So many of them are already broader in their thinking than somebody who's, uh, you know, 23 right, in an right, right. uh, MBA program. Uh, and yet, uh, if they've only worked in the U.S. and not even traveled outside the U.S., they tend to have a U.S. perspective. And the U.S. is a big place. It's a huge market. And so some people have just operated within the boundaries of the U.S. But one of the questions that I ask people when we start this course is, how many of you have children? And about 95% have children. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's not talk about your children. Let's just talk about your grandchildren. What kind of world do you want your grandchildren to have, even if they're not they born yet? They haven't thought about it. Yeah, they haven't thought about it. So then they list a set of attributes that's uh, you know pretty extraordinary. And I say, well, let's talk about what some of your concerns are about the world right now. And so they'll list those concerns. And then, okay, how do we get from point A to point B? Is it possible to do that? Mm -hmm. and most people will then show some concerns. And then I say, really, let's just zoom out a second and ask a really fundamental question. Do you want a world that works for everyone? Don't be too quick to answer that, because if you say yes, that has a lot of implications for your lifestyle and how society is organized. Uh, if you don't want a world that works for everyone, well, you know, that's okay. I'm not being judgmental about it. But let's just think about it. It's a good way to remember. Yeah. And then 
do you go? Do you find 90% of people say I want? Yeah, by the end of it, they, of course, because they begin to realize if they don't. Yeah, they're, it's going to have an impact on them. Exactly, exactly. And they won't be a secure world. There won't be an end to terrorism, you know, and all of that. And, um, and then we go into looking at a range of issues that they, um, they deal with over the course of the semester. And we always go back to the notion that your fundamental assumptions about uh, reality really affect not only your decisions and behaviors and actions, but they also at a collective level affect uh, how we create policies, what our collective operating theory of value is for any given society, and ultimately what the, uh, what the ceiling is on human development. And so it really invites people into a, a dialogue and a, a reflection sure. of a broader world. Okay. And so now in addition to that, as, as you know, I've been deeply involved over the past many years in uh, a vision for something called the Global Cooperative Forum. Right, that's where we connected. Exactly, exactly. So as you know, the late spiritual teacher Adi Da wrote uh, this book, Not to His Peace, and you were one of the endorsers for that, that really painted the possibility for a human civilization based on our intrinsic indivisibility or intrinsic unity. And if we were to really plumb the depths of that from a quantum perspective, you might say, it might give rise to all kinds of human institutions that have a different basis than just competition, difference, separation, limitation. And as, as we've talked in you know, this series about all matter of health and education and employment and uh, governance and the role of technology, seen from the orientation of the totality of this unity, then, wow, whole sets of possibilities open up for our species. And, and we have many, many, many more, uh, well, possibilities mm -hmm. for the human experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I continue to be very committed to that. There's a group in Switzerland that I'm a part of that's exploring this in great depth right now. And the thing that's most encouraging to me, Sam, is that there are young people from around the world, I, I refer to them as young Gandhis, who really uh, understand the importance of such a vision and are, are willing to give their lives over to its embodiment. So this mm -hmm. gives me great great hope because we're... But what do these young people do today? They do a variety of things. So there's a young man who lives uh, actually near the Gandhi Ashram who is a filmmaker. He and his wife create films that... Um, uh, documentaries that attempt to inspire people to live based on uh, Gandhi's principles. Okay. As an example. Yeah, interconnected. Yes, maybe so. Uh, there's a young man, for instance, in uh, Silicon Valley, who's developing um, a social media platform that's not like Facebook around issues of personal interest, but is structured to facilitate uh, collaboration and cooperation together to create new and interesting uh, things. You talked about this, this person from Brazil, don't you? Oh, yeah, there's a guy from Brazil. Very interesting guy, background as an architect who believes that people are more inclined to change when they have, uh, when they play rather than work. And that children are more inclined to change than old folks like us, you know. Yeah, right. And uh, so he has created an online video experience where people from around the world are uh, engaging in part online, but part in their families and communities about experience, and as they hit certain uh, milestones or achieve certain things, they get a badge to go to the next level of the game. So they do something first around their own self-esteem, and then something that creates positive benefit in their family, and then in their neighborhood, and then in their community, and then across communities in their region, and then across 
six countries. And very ambitious fellow. He's attempting to reach two billion people in four wow. years. So it's this kind of vision and this kind of understanding that the world really is interconnected, that we really are one family, that we really do need to find a way to uh, live together. That um, you know gives me great hope. So great. interesting things going on. Good, good. And what's your plan for the next decade? Well, interestingly, I will retire from the university at the end of this uh, academic year, at the end of next June. Oh, I may do some adjunct teaching mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime. But then to my uh, intuition is that this work relative to a new civilization, if you will, is uh, really picking up steam in very tangible ways. And I want to give the uh, uh, next chapter of my life uh, to support But you still that. continue to live in Chicago. Uh, probably. I mean, I'd be willing to live anywhere if it served the uh, greater purpose. And so, but for now, that's the case. Thanks. I have several kids in Chicago at the moment.